This video is going to look at how Spring creates the error message that we receive when we send a bad or incorrect API request. We're then going to look at how we can transform this message to be a little bit more informative to the user so that they can understand why they're receiving the API error. So far within our store controller, we've defined quite a few different endpoints. So we have them for delete mappings, get mappings, put mappings. But in this video, we're going to focus on the two at the bottom. So we have post mapping, which is for adding a new entry into our database, and then also get mapping for just getting a single item back from the database to the user. So in the Postman API, if I want to add a new entry, I can use this add endpoint. So if I send this request with new road NW1, we can see that it's been successful. And then if I were to try and get that new row, we can see that it has an ID of 12. So if I type the number 12 and hit send, we can see that we have this new road down below. Now, if we look at all the entries we have within our database, we don't have an ID of one at the top. So if I were to try and get the ID of one, we can see this error down below where we have timestamp, the status is 500 and the error is internal server error, and it just returns that path back to us. Equally for the post request, if I were to remove the street from our JSON body and then try to send this request to add a new entry to our database, we get the same sort of error, internal server error. This isn't actually really useful because it doesn't tell us what we're doing wrong and maybe if we're missing a different key. And the same for the get request, it doesn't really tell us too much details about what kind of error this is. Is it an error with the database? Is it because we don't have connectivity? Or is it because we're passing in the wrong parameter? For our, our example, that would be the number one. So at the moment within our Spring application, when we need to throw an exception from the controller, this is actually done by a different class called the response entity exception handler. This handler class will use the default error attribute class to build our response. And on line 70 within this class, we can see that a map of string to object is created. It adds the timestamp, then it adds the status, the error details, and also the path. And then if I go back into Postman, we can see all of these details are being printed back to us. So what we're going to do is create a new class that works with the response entity exception handler class. And we're going to redefine how certain exceptions that are thrown from our controller are now going to be handled. So I'm going to begin by creating a new sub package within our controller, and I'm just going to call this controller errors. And we're going to define a new class that extends the response entity exception handler. I'm going to mark this with the annotation of order and I'm going to provide ordered.highestPrecedence. So when our Spring application comes to handling exceptions, it's going to use this class as precedence over the response entity exception handler. So any of the ways that we define how exceptions are handled within this class are going to be used. And then all other exceptions that might be encountered from our application are going to be handled by the response entity exception handler as it would otherwise. So the purpose of this class is to provide exception handling services to the controllers of our application. And we can actually really easily instruct this class to provide that service to all controllers by using the annotation of controller advice. And this provides kind of an aspect orientated programming kind of strategy towards all of the controllers of our application. So for example, if an exception is being thrown, this class will be able to handle those exceptions as and when required. We can reduce the scope for which controllers this class handles. So we can have different key value pairs within the controller advice. So we have annotations to apply to certain annotations. We also have different base packages and different base package classes. But I'm going to leave this empty so we're applying to all controllers of our application. So the first question you might have is which exceptions are we actually trying to handle? So if I look at the console output that we have from earlier by using the Postman API, we can see that when we called the get request to number one, the no such element exception was thrown. And within the console output, we can see that it says no value was present. And then when we try to add a new entry to our database, we had this SQL integrity constraint violation exception. And the output message here is that column street cannot be null. And that's because we removed the value of street 
from our JSON body when we sent that request. So we know which two exceptions we want to handle within this class, and we can now start to define these methods to handling these exceptions. So to define what exception is going to be handled, we use the exception handler annotation. And then within the braces, we say what exception is going to be handled. If I quickly take a look at the response entity exception handler class, we can see how exceptions are being handled from this handle exception method. We can see that it returns a response entity with the type of object. And we can see that it's also using the exception handler annotation at the top, and it's passing in all of the exceptions which it's now going to be handling. Down below, we can see that it's checking the instance type of each of these exceptions, and then it's handling it appropriately. I'm going to define a method that also returns a response entity of type object. The method will receive a HTTP servlet request, and this is essentially the request that is coming into the controller. And it will also receive the exception that is being thrown. I'm just going to copy this for the no such element exception class as well. So now we have the bare bones of our new exception handler. We're going to be handling these two different exceptions and we've defined the response entity that is going to be returned. Now what I'm going to do is create a new custom class that is going to store the variables that we want to return back to the user. So I'm going to create a new class and I'm going to call this error response. Now as part of an error response and as we'll later see with the response entity object, we need to store a HTTP status. I would also like to store a timestamp and also a simple message. I'm just going to provide some formatting to our local date time just to have it in a nicer pattern so it's a little bit more readable. So this will print out the year followed by the month and the day and then the hour, the minute and the seconds. I'm now going to define some getters and setters for these values as well as some constructors for when we want to create our error response. If I move back into our REST exception handler, I'm just going to create a new method down below which will help us to build a response entity by taking in an instance of our error response. So we're going to have a private response entity with the type of object. I'm just going to call it build response entity and that's going to take in an instance of our error response. We'll return a new instance of the response entity and if we take a look at the constructor, we'll need a multi-value map followed by a HTTP status. So that map is going to come from our error response. And then the actual status is also going to come from the error response and we're going to get the status. So now what we can do in these two methods above is build an instance of our error response. We can pass it into the build response entity method and then we can return that back to the user. So if we begin with the top exception handler, this is for the incorrect post response. So let's say we're missing a certain value and for us that would be the street. So I'm just going to define what this error message would be that we send. So let's say we want to tell them that we're not able to submit the post and then we want to understand why we're not able to submit that post. So I'm going to define a new string and I'm going to call that error. And I'm just going to say that we're unable to submit posts. And then because we have this SQL integrity constraint violation exception passed in as an argument, we can then get the message from there. And that message will be a little bit more descriptive telling us exactly what is wrong with the request that we're sending. And then what we're going to do is return the build response entity. And I'm going to define a new error response. The first argument I want to pass in is the HTTP status. So for us, let's say this is a bad request because the request that they're sending is incomplete. So I'm going to type in bad request and we can just import that from HTTP status. And then the message that we're going to provide to our error response instance is going to be the error that we've defined just above. So if I go back into our error response class, we can see that we're defining the HTTP status and then also the message. 
Whenever we create our error response, we also want to instantiate the timestamp. So I'm just going to call this. And now we're going to have all three of these fields defined from our rest exception handler from the exception that is thrown within this method. Now moving down below, this is where we're sending a get request for an element that doesn't exist. So first I'm going to start off by creating a new error response. And by default that's going to have the timestamp included. And then what I would like to do is to set the message to say that the row of the address that is being requested is empty. And then I'm just going to pass back the path that was sent to the API. Within the constructor, I'm just going to put the HTTP status as not found. And now when we build the response entity, we're going to have the HTTP status as not found. We will automatically have the timestamp included. And then the set message will be the row for address is not existent. And we're going to pass back the path that the user sent to us. If I restart our application, if we send a get request to the get address and the number one and send this request, we can now see we have the status of not found. We have a timestamp which we've formatted ourselves. So we have the year followed by the month and then the day. We also have the hour, minutes and seconds. And then we also have this customized message which says the row for address is not existent. And we have get address followed by forward slash one. If I move back into the post request that we made and I try to send this request one more time, we can see now that we have the status of bad request, we have our formatted timestamp, and we also have a message that says unable to submit post, column street cannot be null. And that could be a lot more useful to the user because they now know that they need to include the street within this request in order for it to be submitted. So this is a really simple way how we've been able to transform how exceptions are handled from our controller within our Spring application. We've defined this new error response and it contains the status, the timestamp and a message. And of course you can add any more variables that you would like. And then within our exception handler class, we've now instantiated how those variables would appear back to the user. And you might want to upgrade this. So for example, if you want to include uh, references to tickets or references to any help links, that can also be added for any types of exceptions that you're getting. Our REST exception handler can also be enhanced further. So we can have other types of exception handling that is taken care of. And if you really like, I would advise maybe adding a debug point and then running this in the debug mode. But if I head back into the Postman and I send this request, we'll now be able to see into the HTTP servlet request and the no such element exception that we receive at this very point. And then you can find further information that you can get from each request and how you might want to extract values from this to then be included within the error response.